A powerful scene in a Texas courtroom. A man whose brother was shot to death by a Dallas police officer forgiving his brother's killer and embracing her. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I, see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. You can go on YouTube and watch the rest of it. It's really touching to me. Lord, help us all to be born like that, man. I don't like being emotional. And I don't know why I did that when I'm emotional. But I'll get over it quickly. And uh, I did want to play more of it because what they what they said after that, but the time was going to run short, and uh, I don't want to I don't want to feel rushed through my sermon. So, um, and I want to finish my sermon. I know one time I preached here, and, and I noticed the time, and I thought, oh my Lord, look at the time. And so I kind of abruptly cut it off, and it it then made me sound real great. But I'm just going to say a quick prayer before we get started, Father. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak before these people. I pray, Lord, that everything I would say would be a blessing to them, even though some of it might be hard for them and some of it might be easy. But either way, Father, I pray that you would speak through me. Holy Spirit, please speak through me, because I am not capable of speaking what what needs to be heard by these people today. So I thank you, Lord, that we could be here to openly give you praise and worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if you don't get anything out of my sermon, at least you saw that little clip, and maybe that'll, <laughs> that'll be uh, something you could say you got out of it. But anyway, um, my sermon today is entitled the parable of the church. The parable, and I want to thank Justin. I asked him if he could put the scriptures up. I'm not a techie person, and I, I, I don't do the computer thing very well, and he's into that, so it's like, praise God. He can be used of God to do things like that. And so we, I want to thank Justin for, for doing this. My sermon today is going to be a little bit different than maybe a typical sermon because it's called the parable of the church. And we know, of course, Jesus spoke in parables to try to make things clearer to us, given us stories, given us examples of how we should live. And we know there's many parables, you know, the parable of 
building their house upon the rock or building it on the sand. And there's a story, there's a lesson behind it. So if I can, what I'm trying, going to try to do is kind of speak a little bit in like a parable, kind of analogous to the church. And I want to try to compare the church a little bit to a business. And more specifically, because some people might have a hard time with that, because it's just like, oh, well, we can't, the church is totally different than business. We can't, but Jesus taught in ways like that. You have a vanguard and employees, and this happens and that happens. So, so throughout my sermon, I'm going to probably make reference to business. And more specifically, I'm going to try to compare it somewhat to a restaurant business. If we were to have a restaurant and we would decide we would want to start a restaurant, we would come together as a group, all of us here, and try to decide things like, what kind of restaurant would we want to have? We would have a lot of different opinions about that. I'm sure we would. What kind of food are we going to serve? Are we going to do fast food? Are we going to do you know, sit down and, you know, where we need waiters and waitresses. What kind of, and, and everyone would have a different opinion. Mike might want to say, you know, there, there's going to be things like we can come up maybe, and Mike would say, well, if we're going to serve, let's make sure we have ham sandwiches and <laughs> sausage and whatever. And we, some of us would say, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. We maybe, let's, let's not have pork. Are we going to, be open on Saturday. Well, I think we could all agree here that we would, we would decide that no, we're gonna we're gonna close on Saturdays. We're not gonna be open for business on Saturday. And we would all have different opinions, of course, on the way. And the church is no different. We come to church and we have our ideas of what church should be, how the service should be conducted, what the worship should be like, what the sermon might. You know, a lot of intricate details in that. I know a while back I was talking to Mike again, and, and Mike asked me a question. He said, well, we were talking about the church. He said, what would you, something to the effect of what would you want the church to be if it, if it was up to you? Well, boy, I have a lot of different ideas. Some things are the same, and there's things that I would, I, would, I would do differently, you know? And it's, we all have different opinions, but the response I gave him, do you remember the response I gave him? I don't. <laughs> he doesn't pay attention when we yeah. talk, but anyway. <laughs> um, I said, well, the number one thing I'd like to see is maybe two or three hundred people at our church. Oh, well, yeah, you know. We would all like to see more people. We would like to meet in a bigger, I'd like to, at least for me, I would like to meet in a bigger church and have a lot more people, especially if I'm preaching. Like I've told people before, in the past when I preached, I didn't want hardly any people there <laughs> at the first couple sermons. Now, I was just like, oh man, I call the number of people and say, hey, can you come? Because I'd like to see people in the audience. So we have a lot of different ideas of what we think church should be. But if we were going to start a restaurant, what would the number one thing be that people, that you feel people are looking for in a restaurant? Have a little taste good. Your product. What's on the menu? Food. <clears throat> right? Do you got good food? If we don't have good food, <laughs> it won't be long and we'll be out of business. It's not the food, it's the chef who's cooking it that makes it an excellent thing. So you I'm preaching the service in <laughs> I don't like it when people start it. <clears throat> that was going to be my third okay. point. We're not on the same line. But that's good. That's okay. The thing is, is and, and so we have to have good food. And you know what? The food that we got, we got God's word in our church. 
that's some pretty good food. It's nutritious. It's good for us. It's good for everybody. But it's kind of interesting. We talked about it at Sabbath school a little bit. A lot of people don't want the food. They don't want God's word. But how can we make that food better? Appetizing. Like Sina said. You know, if there was one thing that, well, let me say this. I think this kind of touches on what Cinda was saying. But our church has to be relevant for today. A lot of times, if I could speak to pastors, if I could give any advice, because I've listened to a lot of sermons in my life, and by different denominations and whatever, and the one thing that I see with really good pastors or evangelist speakers is it's very relevant for our day. We can't, you know, if we had a restaurant and we decided, okay, we got the food now and we're just going to go willy-nilly and, and, uh, and we don't make any preparation or whatever and we, the customers come and they order a half a chicken and, and a potato and a salad and we show up and we don't have a cook there and whatever, we're not prepared, of course. And then so we come and we serve them a frozen piece of chicken and a potato. Or, I mean, that's kind of absurd, isn't it? But sometimes that's the way it is with ministers. And I hate to say it, but they talk about the word or whatever, but it's not relevant to today. We... You know, if we're strong, you know, I'm just like all the rest of you. I struggle day to day. I get beat up in this world just like you guys do. And we struggle, in, and if I'm struggling or fighting with my job, if I'm struggling or fighting with my wife, I mean, I think of Keith, you're struggling and, and dealing with your, your wife in that horrible situation. But if we're not ever speaking to the needs of the people, it's like, what good is it? What good are we here if we're not going to pray for people, if we're not going to lift up them, if we're not going to encourage them? Our church needs to be relevant for today. If we start a restaurant, we need to have a good manager. And I would equate that to a pastor. Now, we're in kind of a peculiar situation here because our pastor is gone much of the time speaking in other establishments, if I could say it that way, in our communities. And so a lot does fall on the pastor. Like they say, unfortunately, the pastors not do that often. So, But I hate to say it, but many times, so goes the pastor, so goes the church. I see it all the time in other churches and whatever. If the, if the pastor is not bringing relevant, good food for us, people vote on the restaurant with their feet. They don't come up. And it's like they say, I'm not criticizing pastors or anything like that. I don't want to do that. But the thing is, is sometimes in our world, we, we, we don't treat things in honesty and truth, we, uh, in regards to the maybe the minister or whatever, and sometimes the, I want to be real careful here because I think our pastor does a de decent job and he's not here most of the time because he's serving in other churches. But that's okay because then that gives other opportunities for assistant managers, if I could say, gives me an opportunity to speak and maybe others to speak. But you have to have good leadership in your church. You just have to have good leadership. Just like an example is um, that my mom and dad one day, and my mom was supposed to be, she was going to get something to eat for her and, and my dad, and she was gone for like 45 minutes. She got back, and it's like, we're getting a little bit concerned about her. It's like, where were you at? It's just like, well... She went to a fast food restaurant here in town and it took her a half hour to get her food. Well, if you have that kind of 
church <laughs> that doesn't give good service, doesn't give good messages and, and healing to people, people aren't going to come. And I hate to say it, but so much of the time, things go from the management on down. One thing is, is I know, and sometimes, and this is, might be kind of tough to say, and I, and I hate to say it, but sometimes we want to be nice to people, and, and that's good, and loving, and caring, and kind, but we also have to be honest with people in our church. And sometimes it's okay to exhort our minister to, to preach the Word of God, to encourage him when he does bring out some great truths. And if they're not bringing out truths, then maybe possibly encouraging them to, to mention things like that. It might not sound very loving and kind, but that's what we need to do, I believe, as a church. Now, a couple months ago, I gave a sermon here. And I got some positive feedback, and I got some negative feedback from that sermon. And I'm okay with that. I really, and, and that's, I think, a good thing. Because people were listening, they were checking things out. And they were in disagreement a little bit with what I said. And like I said, I'm okay with that. And I think sometimes that definitely does need to happen in our church. We need to hold up a standard in our church. One thing I do want to say, though, is if I'm going to preach, and I'm okay with preaching, once in a while, if I need to, or, or if the Lord needs me to do that. But one thing is, is I'm not going to come and just be here <coughs> to tickle your ears. Just to say things that you're going to like, oh, yes, that's good, and whatever. Tell nice Bible stories. One thing I feel like our churches don't do anymore is challenge people. We don't challenge people. Our Bible is full of challenges. But we don't challenge people. Many times, and I think a lot of pastors are scared to challenge people. Because, oh, what if that hurts their feelings? They might walk out of the church. But we can't worry about that. We have to preach the word. And if it offends somebody... Don't get mad at me. Get mad at the, the Bible writers or get mad at God. I just want to bring out a scripture, Luke 14, 25-27. Justin will put that up there. I'll step out of the way so you can see that. But here's, I just brought this scripture up as a challenge. Sometimes we don't want to give people the whole menu because, oh, it might not sit real well with them. But it says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me, cannot be my disciple. Now, I don't know about you, but I struggle with that. I, I, I love my mom and dad quite a bit, and now as I got older, then I got married. I love my wife. I don't always treat her the best that I can, but I certainly love her. And I think maybe a better way of saying it in there, it says, and it's definitely, I believe, using hyperbole there. But if you don't, if you don't love God the most in your life, to me, that's a big challenge. Does that challenge any any of the rest of you? Mm -hmm. That's tough. Because it's like, man, I love my kids. I mean, I love my little Jenny. <laughs> 
She's my girl. And, uh, and to put God above her, above my wife, above everybody else, above our job, and even above ourselves is kind of tough. But back to the restaurant business. So if we would start a restaurant together, um, we would have a lot of different ideas of what that restaurant would be, just like you mentioned early, earlier with the church. You know, we're hoping our church will grow. At least I certainly am. That's what we're here for. We're here so that other people can find and learn the truth. And sometimes it gets tough because, you know, one thing I, I would like to mention, when I was at Men's Retreat, something the speaker said there at Men's Retreat, he said, the traditional churches are dying out. He said the more evangelical churches are the ones that are growing. Now, I didn't research that out. I don't know, but I've heard that before. And if you look at other churches, other denominations, um, you see that's true. If you go to the traditional churches that do things kind of by road or whatever, you'll notice there's no children there. Typically, there's, you know, it's all older people. And that's a tough situation. Because there's so many good things about the way church has been conducted throughout history. But it has to be relevant for today. Whatever that is, that's something that we maybe can look at and decide what that is. Just something to think about. I know my mom goes to, my mom and dad go to a very evangelical church here. And she doesn't like the music very well there. She doesn't like how it's going, but she continues to go. And we won't always like necessarily what's presented to us in a church service. But she's talked about the music, and she's, but she said she does certain things in the worship service to keep her focus on God. She says, I don't necessarily pay attention to a lot of the music. She said, I like I, I look at the words and I focus on the words. And I thought that was that was very good of my mom to say that. Now I realize there's going to be certain things that we're never going to compromise on. We're not going to compromise on the Sabbath. We're not going to compromise on the meaning of hell and what that is the state of the dead. There's all those things like that that we, the 27 fundamental beliefs of our church, I don't think we're going to compromise. We might struggle with one or two of them in a personal way. And in our church, we might struggle with certain things, the way it goes and whatever. But the important thing is that we come and that we be a part of the church. 1 Corinthians 12 21 through 27 says, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews, Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. We're all here, the body of Christ here. If we're in Christ, we're one body. This is what it's saying. And some are eyes and some are ears, and we all have these different parts of the body. You know, it's kind of interesting, but I missed a couple weeks, and I was here last week, and most of you weren't here, and so I missed... I miss my body here, <laughs> a lot of my body parts. I even miss teeth a little bit. And <laughs> you might find it kind of funny, but uh, I, I consider Keith a pretty good friend of mine now. 
that might surprise you a little bit if you were here a couple of years ago and you heard a little discussion that me and Keith had in a potluck. But I consider Keith my friend, and, and I it was a couple, three weeks, and I had heard. I sent him a text, and he didn't respond to me. And then I found out that some of my texts weren't getting through to people. And uh, apparently, they didn't get through to Keith. I don't know. <laughs> you know, he's lying to me. I'm not, no, I don't think so. But you know, there's one thing that bothers me a little bit about Keith. <laughs> I didn't tell Keith that I was going to talk about him in the service today. But I like to call Keith once in a while, see how he's doing, see how he's going with his wife. But, and he doesn't let me talk enough. <laughs> he talks and talks and talks. And I listen and listen and listen. And I say a couple things and then he starts talking again. <laughs> but, but I'm okay with that. You know, because one thing about when I talk to Keith, without a shadow of a doubt, he'll tell me some positive things about me and my family and my kids. He gives me good. And it's just like, wow, that's great. We not, we probably, and I know we won't agree on certain things, but we come together as one body. And even though he makes me itch once in a while, he's going to scratch and get rid of the itch. And I'm sure I do the same thing to him. <laughs> I called him last night. I said I wanted him to make sure he was here today because I was going to do the talking today and he was going to listen. <laughs> Amen. So I'm thankful. I'm thankful for everyone that's here. One thing is, is in our church, we do have to be, just like the restaurant, we have to be careful of certain things. We don't want to serve bad food. We don't want to get salmonella or whatever. That will be the demise of our church immediately. And sometimes that can happen in our church, too. A little poison gets in the... And I know there's a lot of churches out there that serve a little poison with their food. It's not good stuff. It's dangerous stuff. And sometimes that can creep into our church too. The Seventh-day Adventist. And I want to give an example of that. A few years ago, I was given a sermon in a church in, uh, in Minneapolis area. And in that church, they had got to a point, and there was some a couple elderly folks that were kind of in charge of the music of the meeting, and they did a good job. They did a fine job of playing the piano and leading in this church. But they got to the point. I mean, they were getting older, and you know how it is. Our motor skills slow down, and, and it just and it's sometimes we get to that point where we need new, we need it fresh in our church and so they started switching off it was a good idea uh, one weekend one sabbath they would have a younger lady she played the piano and did a good job and then there was a couple guys there and they would do concerts once in a while but they and they were excellent the guy was an excellent piano player wasn't he he was just he could all oh, he played by ear and it was beautiful what he played and his partner played the saxophone. And he would be, oh, I mean, just extremely talented. But that didn't seem to go over real well with the whole church. And I think, if I could be honest, because I know the other members in the church and stuff, that sometimes it's just like if maybe they were just a little bit too good. And it kind of maybe bothered some of the ones where, and it's hard because it's like you see people coming in and taking your spot, can I say? And that doesn't always go over real well. But other than that, everybody you could just tell the demeanor and the audience and stuff in, in the congregation was just really positive 
when they would play music? Well, I was going to preach this one sermon, and I called him up because I wanted him to try to play a song that wasn't a hymn song. And, and, uh, and we got into this long conversation. I didn't know the guy real well, but I just really felt blessed by their ministry. And um, we started talking, and he said, uh, you know, I can't play that song, John. But he said, you can play it on the on the screen or whatever, and we can sing along. And he said, John, there's nothing wrong with that song. There's now, I played that song, and it didn't necessarily go over well with everybody in the church, but I think for the most part it went over really well. We're not all going to like the same things. But anyway, this, this guy that was so gifted at the piano, he said, you know, he said, I really struggled coming to the Adventist church to play. And now he said, my doctrines agree mostly with the Adventist church, more than any other church. But he says, I do play at a Sunday church. We're asked there to play at a, at a Sunday church, and so we play there. And he said, you know, John, he said, one time I played at an Adventist church. It wasn't the church that we were going to. But he said, I played at the Adventist church, and after the service, he, he said, an elderly lady came up to me and said, your music is of the devil. Now, I don't know the whole story. I wasn't there. And I'm glad I wasn't there. Because <laughs> if I would have been there, and if I would have heard that, I probably would have said, no ma'am, you're of the devil. <laughs> we get this idea of what church should be, and what we want it to be like, and if it doesn't go according to my way and how I want it, then you're of the devil. I think that's so wrong. And the damage that that person did. Now, I'm not saying that that person should be kicked out of the church or whatever, but it does need to be dealt with. If we have a rot restaurant and the food is starting to rot, if we get mold on the cheese, you know, we don't necessarily have to throw the whole block of cheese out. You know, we can cut the mold off. I don't know, maybe you guys don't agree with that, but <laughs> the cheese is good underneath. Yeah. If it's not too bad, too far gone. And we could maybe still put up that. Now, there is going to be times where people go overboard, and I've seen where, and there is a biblical precedence for kicking people out of a church. And I've seen it in churches that's had to happen. Because it, they went too far. They went, and they're too antagonistic, too whatever. And that may happen. And I think that's obviously a last resort of what should happen. But nonetheless, those things happen. And they have to be dealt with. I, and uh, the best way we can, loving way we can. I know there was a gentleman that came to our church maybe a year or two or three ago. I don't remember. Now, I'll just preface this is I don't know if it's anyone anyone knows here. I don't know. He's kind of from this area or whatever. And we had potluck and we were talking to each other. And I know I'm really meddling here. Sorry about that. But anyway. And I was visiting with this older gentleman, and uh, in the conversation he says, you know, one big issue I have with the church, I said, what's that? He says, men that don't show up to church wearing a suit. <laughs> I don't know. That puts you all, all you men in a real precarious situation here. <laughs> Now, you can make good arguments for everything. I can make a pretty, probably could preach a sermon and probably make a, that we should try to present ourselves to the Lord the best we can. There is that argument. Shoot, I think on that day, I think Mike was wearing shorts of all things. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's just like, my goodness. And you know, a personal thing for me is if I'm going to speak, <laughs> preach in front of people, I, I dress up. And the thing is, is if we're going to start saying you're the devil, and you got to do this, and you got to do that to come to church, that's fine. But then you go to your Bible, and you open up the Bible, and you, and you get the book and the chapter and verse. And you say, see? See there in Ephesians 12, if you show up to church, you need to wear a suit and tie. That's what the Bible says. And then who can argue with that? But see, obviously, there isn't a biblical precedence for that. You can come as you are, and I'm perfectly okay. I know most of the time, probably I show up, and, and, it's, and it's, you know what? Things have evolved in the church. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad? Have we become a little bit too lax in some things? Probably. Have we come and, you know, we come a little more casual or a little bit more comfortable? Didn't Jesus say it's not what goes in, it's what comes out? And if we're just looking at the outer appearance like that? But it's tough because that generation believes that. And I'm okay. Come wear your suit. Come wear your jeans. Come wear your shorts. <laughs> if you sometimes I know one time I watched, I flipped and I saw this pastor, preacher, whatever, preaching, and he was wearing a Vikings jersey. I don't like that. I think if you're a preacher of the gospel, I mean the twins, I don't know if they won yet or not, don't let me know. But the twins are in this this game. Were some of you watching the game last night? I'm saying, <laughs> on Sabbath? Oh no. But I'm not going to show up in my twins jersey, you know, because I'm a twins fan. I don't, I don't think that's appropriate, but... And there are ways of dealing with that. If I was going to that church, I would maybe go up to that pastor and say, you know, I can't open the Bible and say you shouldn't preach with a Vikings jersey on. But it did kind of turn me off a little bit. You know, I just don't like that. We can do that. I don't really like your style of music. But if we're giving God praise and worship, I'm okay with that. Or, I'm not okay with it. We all have to live and deal with those things in our lives. One thing I do want to say is we need you in the church. If we had a restaurant, we would have waitresses and waiters. We would have busboys, managers, all the above. We would need everybody. There would be just like the body. We need our hands and our eyes and our ears. We need it all to work properly together. And this is no different. And you know what? There's going to be some people that they're just going to come to eat. And that's okay. That is okay. Not everybody has to be have this role and preach a sermon or sing it, you know, lead the songs or do offerings or whatever. We have people, but we need customers. And we want to be here when those customers come to help them and encourage them. Don't doubt about it. We always can use workers. And we should always be open doing the work of God, whatever that may be. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body, 
And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And this is what I'm trying to get to right here. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, I miss my fair share of church, just like everybody else does. Well, I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't talk for everybody else. I'll talk for myself. I miss. And sometimes I miss for good reasons, and sometimes I miss for bad reasons. Sometimes my heart's not right. I, I know fairly recently I missed church because my heart wasn't right. And I didn't want to be here now. This is the perfect, this probably should have been the perfect place for me to be if my heart's not ready. But my heart wasn't right. And I missed, and you know, I wasn't afraid. <laughs> I'm just being real, I wasn't planning to say this, but real matter of factly, I, I, I try, I'm a pretty transparent guy. I'll try to, you know, be honest with you the way I am. But I came here. Drop my kids off, drop my wife off, and I, I left. I did spend time in prayer. Now that maybe wasn't a good, good example to my family, but that's what I did. And I went to Camden Park. And I worshiped God in my own way that day. <laughs> Should have brought that up, and that's okay. It was okay for me. It was a beautiful, beautiful day, and I thank God that He met me there, standing on a bridge. I'm an emotional person. I, I apologize for that. I'm not trying to do this. I wasn't expecting you to say that. I wasn't anything else. But that's okay. Sometimes we need that. And sometimes we need to give other people the space to do that too. The fact of the matter is, is church isn't all about me. Church isn't all about you. We come, hopefully the number one thing that you come here to do is to give a great God awesome and honor and praise. Amen. That's what we're here for. Romans 12, 3 through 8. We read it. Cinder read it for us, and I, I want to read it. Actually, I'm just gonna I'm gonna skip to verse six. We have different different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with the grace given to each of us. If your gift, or I'm sorry, let me skip a line. Then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. You know, some of us here, we're not real great at giving mercy. I mentioned, I gave the example talking with Keith. 
like they say, I don't know if he tries to do it on purpose or whatever, but almost every time I talk to him, which isn't real often, but he encourages me. Maybe he knows I need that, but maybe the Holy Spirit actually works through he. <laughs> of all people. And God can work. I should, I'm just teasing, please. I'm just joking. I love giving to you the hard time. And maybe that's what you're here for. Maybe you need encouragement. Maybe that's your gifting. If my gifting is giving a sermon, I don't know. I guess you guys can be the judge of that. I'm willing to preach more. But I don't know if that's what the church wants. And that's okay. If, if we want, we hear a lot of good sermons on video. And that's okay. I can preach more, and I will. But I don't want to force myself here by any means. And maybe please don't judge me on one sermon or two. <laughs> maybe I can redeem myself in a different one. I don't know. <laughs> but we are the body. And we need you here. We want you here. It encourages me. And uh, I talked to Jesse a little bit last night. And we just talked real briefly, not very long. And I says, yeah, I hope you guys can be there. I'd love to see Dave there, because I'm going to preach. I want to see him there every week, of course. But when I come to church, I want to see you all here. <laughs> if I'm not here, well, then you all can be gone, I guess. <laughs> but, but that's the way it is, because it encourages me. When I first came to Marshall SBA, it was Mike and a bunch of women here. <laughs> and I thought to myself, how awful. <laughs> how wonderfully awful. <laughs> and I don't know, but if I was in Mike's situation, I don't know if I would have kept coming. But then, like, you, was, then you would have missed our women's prayer. Well, <laughs> praise God. And now we just about outnumber the women. And it, it's needed. <laughs> Amen? And I don't know if that encourages you right now to see a couple, three, four other guys. I know your encouragement. Steve, Liz, and Hendricks. Town I was raised up, never asked people if you know who John Clapp was and Henry. <laughs> don't, don't just, just say. I didn't know your last name. Oh, well, good. Oh, well, well, forget it then. Because <laughs> <laughs> you might hear a bad thing or two. I don't know. But, um, but it is encouraging. And I go oh, back to Jesse talking about And it's tough because they bring their children here to interact with all the other little children here. <laughs> well, those other children aren't here. But that's why we need to pray. We can pray. It's like, Lord, I don't know why he hasn't answered. My kids are okay with coming to church here without others, especially my son. He's okay with it. And I think I grew up with church friends, and we had a good time. Sometimes we had too good of a time, and sometimes it can be a detriment other kids. I'm saying that's one thing that's a real positive thing with my son. He has no one to influence him. He's as white as you can be, in more ways than one. But um, yeah, he doesn't have a lot of bad influence, but it would be nice if to see a couple young people around. To, and see if they have church friends to interact with, especially when they're homeschooled. I know Jan, she's desperate for friendship. She's friends, I want friends, I love friends. Wants friends. Same way with your kids. It's hard coming to church when there's no, if the kids are going, let's 
go to church, let's go to church, and, you know, but it's just like, you know, it's kind of tough to listen to the guys preach when they're that age <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> but we need to pray. We need to pray for more children. We need to pray for more young people. We need to pray for more old people. We can't have the church be everything to everybody. But Jesus is everything to everybody. We just don't realize it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's stand and sing our closing song.